This is me training for the Northeast Ridge Route of Mount Everest. I did hours and hours and hours of running on the stupid hamster wheel. To help me get through the four to eight hour workouts, I watched, rewatched, and rewatched again YouTube videos on Everest. They ranged from great to mediocre to terrible, but I always felt hungry for more information, no matter the quality. I have made this video series because I want to give future climbers a useful way to kill time in the thick of their own long workouts as they pursue their dream to the top. Welcome to Everest for Mountaineers. My background in mountaineering comes from climbing snow-capped volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. I've been an avid backcountry skier with several years of 100 plus days on snow. However, it was a climb on Denali with my good friend Paco Monadero and Dave Kellogg that introduced me to the big mountains. Paco was on a mission to climb the seven summits, the highest mountains on each continent. Before him, I had never heard of the Seven Summits objective. On Denali, I listened intently to his stories, as well as the stories from a handful of others who were traveling the world for similar dreams. Okay, stupid thing, you catch a cramp on you, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, 45 degrees, and you're going fast, and you don't have your ice axe out, you're dead. What's your phone number? My phone number is 703-585. Have you seen it? <laughs> it's freaking insane! I had become hooked on the challenge, the views, and bonding with these like-minded idiots. After Denali, I ventured to Africa and joined Kili World Born Safaris, a guide group, and its accompanying porters to summit Kilimanjaro. The next summer, I met up with Dave in Russia for his wedding. And then afterwards, I guess you could call it a honeymoon. Busted. Dave and I skied up, climbed on our hands and knees, summited, and skied down Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. For my next winter vacation, I headed down to South America, where I joined Patrick, whom I met on Denali, and together we tackled Aconcagua. Within four years of my Denali summit, I was staring down the last three of the seven summits. The most remote, Karsten's Pyramid, Indonesia. The most expensive, Mount Vinson, Antarctica. And the highest, also not cheap, and most deadly, Mount Everest. My plan was to save and save for Antarctica, eventually bag that peak, find enough time to get out to Karsten's and cross that one off too. Then, and only then, I would consider the feasibility of an Everest climb. Meanwhile, in 2014, Patrick had a different plan. He was heading off to Everest, I was following his Everest preparations on his website, Climbing on Purpose. More than anything, I wanted to see how he did on Everest to get a feel for how I may fare. He put in a year of training, paid his money, and made it to Everest Base Camp on the south side. Then disaster struck. On April 18th, part of the overhanging ice cliffs above the notorious Kumbu Icefall crumbled, killing 18 Sherpa. The tragedy ended the climbing season. Patrick's first attempt on Everest went only as far as touching the ground above base camp. Another year of training, another payment to summit climb for an Everest expedition. And in April 2015, Patrick was back at Everest base camp in the same exact spot he was a year ago. He and his teammates from summit climb made it through the Kumbu Icefall safely and then upon reaching Camp 1 at 6,250 meters, disaster struck again. At 11.56 a.m. on April 25th, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake rocked Nepal and Everest. When we got up there on the 25th, we felt the earthquake, and then we also felt an avalanche hit our 
our campsite. This was a catastrophe of epic proportions. And here's a helicopter helping us evacuate from Camp One. After our evacuation, we came back to this. Other than seeing a campsite that had a, uh, a large array of fully erected tents, we saw nothing but debris spread out, uh, mattress pads and tent shreds all over the place, sleeping bags down, there was just about everything that you can imagine spread throughout camp. It was a nightmare. The climbing season was over. Patrick's second attempt on Everest, and he didn't even get to test his preparations past Camp One. Patrick decided to hold off on any more Everest attempts and instead completed the swimming triple crown. Around Manhattan, Los Angeles to Catalina Island, and crossing the English Channel. He was successful on all three. In early 2017, Patrick and I were talking. He said that he wanted one more shot at Everest. He was signing up for a 2018 expedition to the north side of Everest, and he said that I should come with him. My own plan was going nowhere, so I decided it was time. I began my training for Everest. Over five years, Patrick had fine-tuned his Everest training into a detailed Google spreadsheet. Across the top of the spreadsheet included the date, the day of the week, the number of days training, the days left before leaving for the mountain, and phase of training. The teal colored column headers represented how many minutes of each exercise were scheduled for each day. Continuing across the top included Wim Hof breathing, movement preparation, running, elliptical workouts, biking, lifting, core strengthening, swimming, and stretching. For each of those columns, there was a corresponding column where you would put in your actual minutes doing each of the exercises. Many days, I wanted to pad my numbers, but realized that by doing so, I wouldn't be the only one being cheated. If there was any trouble on the mountain, I didn't want to put myself or others at risk because I wasn't physically prepared. So I prepared my body, and in many ways, my mind along with it. Runs along the beach, hours and hours on the elliptical machine. Indoor, and outdoor biking, lifting, core exercises, swimming in the ocean, and yoga. I also researched a guy named Wim Hof, who tried to climb Mount Everest in shorts. I thought, well, he has to be doing something right to even try. And I started practicing his simple method. Through breathing, meditation, and cold immersion, the Wim Hof method has shown to increase your blood oxygen levels, tolerance to cold exposure, and increase your focus. For an Everest expedition, this is exactly what I was looking for. Top three. The first week of Wim Hof breathing blew me away. My entire body was buzzing with oxygen overload. At the tail end of each round of breathing, there is a breath hold. I could hold my breath for up to three minutes, something I had never been able to do before. Also during the breath hold, I would envision myself framed in Tibetan prayer flags, walking happily along the top of the North Kaw. Right after breathing in the morning, my cold exposure routine would start. Cold showers. These were difficult at first, but became routine, and it didn't stop there. During the winter, with the outside temperature around negative 10 degrees Celsius, I would stroll down to the beach in Speedos. There, I would do a round of deep breathing before heading into the 4 degrees Celsius water for a 10 minute swim. In addition, every day, regardless of the temperature or weather, I would ride my bike about 20 kilometers in shorts and a t-shirt. By doing so, I trained my body to know what it was like for my extremities to go completely numb and warm them just before frostbite crept in. Meanwhile, Patrick and I were both using hypoxic generators, tents, and masks, allowing us to live at sea level, but train and sleep at altitude. The generator changes the composition of the air you breathe from 21% oxygen, what is available at sea level, to about 8.8% .8 oxygen equivalent to around 6,700 meters. In order to monitor each other's adaption to altitude, 
Patrick and I shared hypoxic training data, including exercise hours, sleep hours, saturated oxygen levels called SpO2, and heart rates. I started my hypoxic training in October, seven months before the climb began. A large two-person hypoxico tent was comfortable. However, in the large tent, I could only get the oxygen levels down to about 12%, simulating around 4,500 meters. So I made a new tent, a fish tank, that could get the oxygen levels down to 8.8%, simulating the 6,700 meters I was looking for. There were many, many sleepless nights, but I was so extremely focused, it didn't matter. The training continued. That December, I felt I really needed to measure up with Patrick's training. We decided to meet in the Pacific Northwest for some running, climbing, and skiing. Patrick felt great. I felt great. The training was working. Back to China. The amount of time I was putting in at the gym was wearing on me. To avoid a workout boredom slump, I decided to get outside for workouts whenever possible. I ended up climbing the local mountain Fushan at 360 meters many different ways, through a demolished village in the snow, with students, with new friends I met on the mountain, and once from sea level with a full 19 liter water bottle. Other ways I prepared for Everest included brushing up on my rock climbing and rappelling skills, both on natural outdoor features and on an indoor rock wall. For additional fitness, whenever I had a spare hour, I would do a YouTube Fitness Blender workout. As excessive exercise had landed me at the acupuncturist before, at the end of a long day, I would roll out my sore and tired muscles to prevent injury. March arrived quickly. I found a cliff that was similar to the second step that you encounter during the summit night of Everest. With all my summit equipment on, I practiced going up and down the cliff. It was a beautiful night. The city lights were shining and it was about 15 degrees Celsius. Perfect, unless you are wearing a summit suit built for negative 40 degrees. Uh, it's crazy that I'm actually going up there. Like, you think about like, being on the North Coal Ridge and looking out, awesome. Getting up to Camp 3, awesome. Then that last night, man, there's so many things that can go wrong, whether it's altitude or equipment or weather, you just don't know. But, uh, you know, we're gonna take it, take it safe, take it smart, and control all the controllables. That's what, why we're out here right now, trying to figure everything out. Man, these gloves are tough to deal with. They're super warm, but really hard to deal with. I've got a problem with my hood always coming down in front of my light so that's something i gotta work out can't imagine we'll have this plus an oxygen mask as well crampons are doing awesome i thought they were going to be a little loose on the rock but i cinched them down really tight and they feel really good really solid warm right now hopefully i'll be at this warm on top of the everest <laughs> during my everest research i read a blog that when you head off for everest you should be in the best shape of your life and believe it. Virtually training alongside Patrick, my own focus, and the support of those closest to me had allowed me to be in the best shape of my life, and I believed it. It was time to pack. Tomorrow, I would leave for Tibet. From my home in Qingdao, China, I flew to Lhasa, Tibet. Entering the city, I was immediately overwhelmed with nostalgia, as I had been here before with Dave in 2007. We rode mountain bikes from Lhasa to Mount Everest Base Camp and down into Kathmandu, Nepal. With the rest of my climbing team driving up from Nepal, I needed to continue west across the Tibetan Plateau to meet them. On the way, I spent a day in Shigatse, the second largest city in Tibet. Thinking back to the bike trip a decade earlier, I didn't have favorable memories of this city. However, spending a gorgeous afternoon exploring the Tashi Lumpo Monastery and the surrounding hills helped me realize what a gem this city really is.
The next day, I reached a small village called Tingri. There, I met up with the Summit Climb team, including Patrick. We took a hike up to the Galong Monastery to catch up. So, uh, Everest is to the right, Choi is to the left. This quickly turned into a disagreement of which mountains we could see. That was Everest on the left, and Cho Oyu was on the right. Sorry, Patrick, you were wrong. All right, we'll see. You got it on, we have it on video. The next day, we did an acclimatization hike up a local peak with the team. It was hard to take it slow, but doing so made the climb easy. All right, so you see these pickup trucks here? They carry all of our gear to base camp. It's kind of stupid. The drive from Tingri heads back towards Shigatsi, but then takes a turn south at the entrance to the Mount Everest National Park. It continues through the town of Chietsun before heading up the nauseating switchbacks of the Golula Pass. The top of the pass at 5,198 meters offers one of the best views of the Himalayas. Coming down from Gawula Pass, you reach Jashi Zongtsun, where we picked up last minute Oreos. Another couple of hours, and we pulled up to the new Rongbuk Monastery and permit check. You'll likely have to do a handful of these as you travel through Tibet. All right, we're here. What do you think? We made it. We made it. Almost made it. We have to get past this final check. <laughs> yeah, we got, a, we got some shipping container people who are going to come out and give us some grief, I'm sure. After a relatively minimal amount of grief, we were let through. Finally, we arrived at Chinese Base Camp. Kelje. Yes, sir. I'm Brendan. Brendan. Nice to meet you. Patrick. We just got to me. I know. Yeah, you remember me. We just got to base camp, setting up, uh, picking our tents, bringing all our gear, sorting it out. Good. Beautiful day. Everest looking fantastic. Gail J. Sherpa was one of the Sherpas that was with Patrick during his 2014 and 2015 Everest Summit attempts. All of us took our time putting our camp together, except for this man, Jongbu, our head Sherpa. He has summited Everest 17 times and was always hustling and smiling. The sun dipped behind the mountains and I headed to my tent. I felt a little bit of comfort knowing that Jongbu was going to the summit with us. I had wanted to wait for the sunbeams to get up, but the whipping of the prayer flags against my tent that fellow climber Martin had put up the night before urged me out. We all started rustling and got to the first order of business, emptying our pee bottles. Patrick and I both had the 96 ounce Nalgene Canteen, a must for any expedition. Too many climbers have used the regular Nalgene bottles as pee bottles and mixed them up in the middle of the night when reaching for a drink. After taking care of the morning business, we headed into our black Tibetan tea house themed tent and warmed up with tea while the kitchen boys, as they're called, Nobu and Tashi, brought in breakfast. This was the first and last time I had eggs for breakfast. The rest of my days on the mountain, I would stick to porridge. 4K breakfast. Our expedition leader, David, from the UK, gave us our morning briefing. Uh, it's a take it easy day, really, today. Uh, if you're feeling good, there is a walk up <coughs> this hill behind us there uh, that you can gain some altitude and you can look over the, uh, uh, the camp. But uh, that's, you know, really it's preferable to, to take it easy. If you, or get your gear ready. So the yaks are coming on the 19th and there'll be a whole load of uh, bells clanking all night long and that, what with that and uh, Martin's prayer flags, you might not have the best <laughs> okay, I got it. So this is our mess tent down here at base camp. Patrick's going to give us the tour. This is where we eat, relax, lounge, socialize. And so most of the team members are around here. Everyone seems to have found their own spot. We have an unusual tent because we have a Tibetan tea house motif. And most of the other ones are big, these big dome tents that are sterile and hard to warm up. And it gets very warm during the daytime. And at night and early in the morning, it is not. This is our first morning at base camp. It's pretty cold this morning, minus 12. Just had breakfast and we're told our jobs for the day are to sort our gear that's gonna go up to interim camp and then advanced base camp. The Sherpas sorted gear, 
we sorted gear. The goal was to get everything ready for moving up the mountain. While the yaks would be constantly traveling between the camps, this first big movement of equipment is when you want to organize everything you will need for higher up. The better you can plan for what you need at successive camps, the less shuffling of gear and carrying you will have to do later on. Patrick and I took things slow. We drank as much water as possible. It was hard to stay focused on a task as Everest and all the possibilities stood in front of us. Staring at the peak, you squint your eyes to find Camp 3, the exit cracks, and the three steps, large cliffs that are known as the crux of the North Ridge route. To calm my nerves, I wandered around for a peaceful spot to do some deep breathing. I would do three rounds of 30 breaths. On the 30th breath, I would exhale completely and envision myself moving up the mountain framed in prayer flags. The scripts on the flags are blessings and the constant Tibetan winds disperse them. Looking out over base camp, it was clear to see who the big players were and hard to not be intimidated. I went to bed that night thinking that the last thing I wanted was to be put in a position where I was slowing others down on the climb. Or worse. Uh, we've been at base camp for three days now, at Chinese base camp. We each have our own individual tents. Mine is right here. And the view of Everest from here is ridiculous. It's so hard to stop taking pictures of this mountain. Awesome. Right now the uh, Sherpas are weighing all the different bags for the yaks. Hey, Jangbu, yes, this is all for the yaks, right? Yeah. This is for the yaks? All the way to advanced base camp? Yeah, ABC. ABC. Looks like the boys are coming to pick up our gear. The next morning, Team Yak and its herdsmen had arrived. Each yak cost $350 to carry gear to advanced base camp. This was the time to earn their keep. Yaks weigh the same amount as two grand pianos. They can survive winters at high altitudes where the temperatures can get down to negative 40 degrees. And lucky for us, they can carry heavy loads at high altitudes. Hey, that's my bag. It's cool getting to know the people on our team, joking around with them, playing cards. Definitely a lot of downtime, getting some reading done, which is really nice. Definitely a little nervous about every step after this. So like tomorrow is our hike up to interim camp Then we're there for two days and you're always just thinking, you know, is it going to be cold? Do I have enough stuff? Am I going to sleep? Am I going to get a headache? I seem to be worried a lot more than I should. I'm like super positive about being able to do this. Still the unknowns of what's to come are uh, daunting, I guess. To make use of the time, I admired the view washed clothes, and practiced my Wim Hof breathing. One of the afflictions that Everest climbers face is called the Kumbu cough, a result of inhaling extremely cold and extremely dry air. In order to reduce my chances of getting the Kumbu cough, I always did my breathing with my air pollution mask on. This kept the air I was inhaling relatively moist and warm. At 5,364 meters, having an SpO2 of 95 is very high. However, what I find most interesting about the breathing is the breath hold at the end. My SpO2 and heart rate both decrease. However, my heart rate keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Just then, it had gone from 110 beats per minute to 50 beats per minute. That is something I wasn't expecting. I can only think that my body is learning to relax and use as little oxygen as possible during the breath hold. Today is day four at uh, Chinese base camp. We we're supposed to head up to interim camp today, but because the ropes haven't been fixed on the North Call, we're gonna just do an acclimatization hike up this guy right over here. Um, you can see some people up there. They're super, super tiny. So it's way bigger than it looks. Patrick and I are both gonna go with pretty heavy packs just so we can get uh, used to traveling with heavy pack. Cause I haven't done that for so I put a giant bottle of water in my backpack and climbed Fushan. A little bit different. The whole Summit Climb team decided to make it a group effort, and we all left camp together. The trail was steep out of the gate, 
passed by a valley of prayer flags, and came to a cliff band where other teams were practicing their technical skills. We decided to take a quick break to allow our expedition leader, David, tell us why the yak negotiations had taken so long that morning. So, basically, additional yaks here cost uh, $350, which is quite a lot, because to buy a yak would cost about $1,000. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yak waiting fee, which basically includes uh, a bag of straw, is a hundred dollars. And uh, one tenth the cost of a yak. <laughs> Indeed. So, <laughs> as much as I try to negotiate, clearly these fellas know there is nowhere else to go. As we got higher up, the rocks became less and less stable. We're on some unnamed peak. We're having flashbacks of Aconcagua. It's a giant rock field where pretty much every rock moves. We're in the same approach shoes that we did Aconcagua in, so we feel comfortable, but yet stupid, because we're doing the same stupid thing we did before. But it's all good. Only a little bit to descend. This hill and practice climb was not worth risking a rolled ankle, so we took in the view of the camp and descended. On the way down, we stopped by some other team's tents, including the Chinese, <laughs> the Russians, the Seven Summits group, the Russian group. Whoa! Hopefully, they don't have Tibet wine. Impressive. And a global team that was preparing to break a world record of highest formal dinner. <laughs> We got back to our tent just in time for our own dinner. Jongbu lit the heater. The chicken noodle soup without the chicken and without the noodles, that was really good. It is. A spoonful of popcorn makes the medicine go down. Then Jongbu, in full smile, surprised us with maybe the highest apple pie in the world. While we were all enjoying the comforts of base camp, we knew they wouldn't last. Tomorrow, we would move up the mountain. It's our fifth morning at Chinese base camp, and today we are packing up and headed up to interim camp. So we're going from 5,200 meters here up to about 5,800 at interim camp. Um, we're all pretty set to go. Uh, looking forward to a nice slow day. That's the key, nice and slow. Ready? Rock and roll! All right, let's do this. Our team left Chinese base camp in a couple of small clumps. Everybody having their own pace and or people they felt they could enjoy the next four to seven hours with. The Northeast Ridge Route is the most popular route for those wanting to climb Everest from the Tibetan side. The trail starts at Chinese Base Camp and meanders at a slight grade along the north side of the Rongbuk Glacier for approximately 5 kilometers, until you reach the confluence of the Rongbuk East Glacier. There, the trail gets much steeper as it follows the west side of the Rongbuk East Glacier another 5 kilometers to Intermediate Base Camp. Most teams spend a night here. Then, the next day, you have some very steep up and downs as the trail, the Miracle Highway, provides you safe passage through an otherwise impassable glacier. After 11 kilometers, you reach advanced base camp. There, the Yak Brigades stop. Our climb was just starting. Alright, just out of camp. It's 11 a.m. Looking at a, a four to seven hour hike? Yeah, something like that. So if we nail it around six, that'll be fine. awesome. Again, we're trying to just go slow. No heart rate above 110. Yeah. Patrick likes going fast. I liked following him because he kept me moving. The pink Olivia flag is a token of remembrance for his good friend's daughter who died at 13 in a sailing accident. He carries it with him on all his big adventures. It gives him strength when he needs it most. Remnants of the receding Rongbuk Glacier are all around you. To the right, there is an enormous glacial lake, and to the left, several massive boulders precariously perched on debris spires. Another highlight, and one of the main reasons to climb Everest from the north side, are the stunning views. You can't help but rejoice in the moment. 
So we are just about at the end of the mellow walk. People are passing, we're passing, pretty awesome. Another hour up a steep grade, and we all took a break at what became known fondly by our team as Lunchtime Corner. Hanky, how you feeling? Good? Uh, it's the best egg I've ever had here. Franz, how you doing? Fine, thanks. How's lunch, Tom? Lunch is we're so ready. good. How heavy is the pack? Man, as heavy as I'd like it right at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> we're going up. <laughs> Ain't no doubt. It's like you food that with you. Let's go. Look at the bird sitting on the back of that guy. <laughs> That is a rock. As we continued up the East Rongbuk Glacier, we were joined by Tibetan blue sheep. Not as blue as I had imagined, but more friendly than I could have ever expected. You guys want to take my pack? We all chugged along, and before we knew it, we caught up to the yaks that had left earlier that morning. The yaks were very shy. We learned that unless you wanted a staring contest, it's best to move off the trail to let them by. You can see the tents from uh, intermediate camp, but we have a huge yak traffic jam going on over here. So we're just coming into interim camp now. Whew, feel good. Uh, definitely tired, but feel really good. Not, no headaches. I think we're hitting close to... Hey, hey Patrick, what's your altimeter? 18,779. We rolled into intermediate base camp and it was clear that the yaks ran this spot. They ate where they wanted, pooped where they wanted, and ran through tent lines line, if line, they wanted. Line, 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 tent. Dom and Magnus arrived at camp. We watched them come to the realization that they would be sleeping on, in, or around yak poop. Good luck. So we made it to intermediate camp today. It took five hours and 20 minutes. And we went from 5,200 meters to 5,800 meters. And it was 11 kilometers? Uh, 9.8, so almost 10. Things are good, sun's going down. Once that sun goes down, it's gonna get cold. Yeah, so we're in. We're in for the night. Good night. We are leaving uh, Intermediate Camp, also known as Yak Poop Camp. And uh, it should be, what, five to seven hours? Oh, uh, no, seven to nine. Seven to nine, yikes. Slowly, slowly, here we go. Feeling a little, had a little headache last night, so hoping that'll go away once I start breathing. Peace. We're an hour outside of uh, Interim Base Camp and we just walked into this amazing area with penitentes and a full view of Everest. It's amazing. The trail from IBC to ABC is known as the Miracle Highway. Since its discovery in 1921, expeditions from Tibet have been using this route to access Everest. The miracle of this trail is a result of the Rongbuk Glacier and the Changsi Glacier pushing massive amounts of earth together as they collide. The glaciers move downhill and the scraped earth has moved with them, creating a large undulating berm in the middle of the two glaciers called a moraine. It provides a hilly, safe, and relatively quick passage up to advanced base camp. Without this miracle moraine, advancing on Everest from this valley may have never been an option, as crossing through the maze of ice pyramids would be treacherous and time consuming. As you turn the final corner to ABC, the trail steepens. Your legs ache, and breathing becomes more difficult. Now, you are at the doorstep of Everest. Oof, we just got to advanced base camp. That is a long hike. I am beat, but I uh, feel pretty strong. And uh, we're just gonna pick our tents now, get some tea. Uh, I actually don't have a headache at all, which is nice. That was a long hike though. Yeah, it's a little more than a hike. It's just good to be here. How you feeling, Martin? Amazing. Beautiful ABC. The summit's so close. So close. McKnight, how you doing? We did it! The adrenaline I had when reaching ABC wore off. I had a little bit of a headache. Could barely move. Went in my tent to do some Wim Hof breathing and 
I don't even think I made it to 20 breaths and passed out. But uh, we're in a pretty cool place. I'm starting to feel a little bit better. So my SpO2 was down at 55 when I woke up from a little nap. It's pretty low. My face is peeling like crazy. And here's our dining tent, not as nice as it was at CBC. But yeah, now it's time to drink water and chill out. Well, it's hard today. <laughs> the next morning, feeling better, we got up and explored ABC. Advanced Base Camp is a sprawl, approximately a kilometer long, scrunched up between the northeast face of Changsi and the East Rongbuk Glacier. As this is the last camp that the Yaks can travel to, all Everest expeditions on the Tibet side funnel through here. This is another camp where you realize that depending on your tent location in the camp, your climb may be an hour longer or an hour shorter than expected. For us, our tents were located near the bottom of ABC, giving us a welcome sense of relief when we arrived from IBC, but adding another hour to our climb when we would move up to the next camp. We're having a bit of a rest day, which turned into a little hike day up to Crampon Point. There, the magnitude of the North Cole climb hit us. Well, that's a pretty big day going to the North Cole. Can you see that? Not only was it going to be a big day, but the risks would increase exponentially. We're at the camp uh, highest point on ABC, and uh, Summit Climb is all at the bottom. We probably got another half an hour to walk. We, we got back to our tent, bus. and David, our guide, was shooing yaks away. I was feeling a bit funky, so I decided to lie down. Oh, oh pretty wasted. My head hurts oh, whenever I move too fast. There's a lot of pressure to get to the top. School and girlfriend, internet. I guess it doesn't really matter. The cold shadow of Changsi quieted the camp. Although I was feeling the external pressures of undertaking this challenge, physically I was feeling better and joined everyone in the mess tent. Jongbu lighting Mr. Heater Jr. is enough to let your worries oh. slip away. <laughs> Boo! Strike one. <laughs> Oh, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Dinner started with soup, then a main course. By the time it was dark and cold, we had peaches for dessert and it was time for bed. Do your figure of eight? You're good. Okay. This day, we lounged around and made sure all of us knew how to use our gear. A little late, if you ask me, but I was just going with the flow. How's it feeling, Franz? Good? Good, good. You just learned today how to use uh, figure eight. Awesome. Franz is an expert now. David passed on his tricks of the trade and emphasized maximizing safety and efficiency. The next morning, I awoke to a surprise. Our first snow day. Today was also the day of our puja ceremony. So it includes uh, some of our climbing equipment to get blessed, uh, but mainly it is to ensure our safe passage on our expedition to, to the summit, hopefully. Uh, and there's a whole load of uh, offerings, uh, which can take the form of uh, edibles and uh, throwables. And uh, we'll have eat some of the edibles and some of the throwables will be thrown to make sure you don't get hit by the oily ones. In Buddhism, puja can be used as expressions of honor, worship, and devotional attention. As David said, the purpose of our puja was to ask for safe passage on our expedition. Our puja started out with some chanting, and continued with some chanting. Prayer flags were raised, and an offering was made. We were forced to chug some bad whiskey, but it was for Buddha, so I guess it was okay. Although it was cold and gloomy, 
Today was our day to practice our rope skills on the ice. Jongbu set the ice screws. Everyone else got ready. A little practice day here at Advanced Base Camp. Good to see that nobody knows how to put their crampons on. <laughs> That's a full workout. With no major mishaps except Patrick's ability or inability to point a camera, I headed back to my tent. So this is my tent at Advanced Base Camp, and I just put some really good time into organizing stuff the way I want it, stuff that needs to go down, stuff that needs to go up. Uh, feeling awesome right now. Brutal, though, is at night, like, I fall asleep perfect, feel great, and then I wake up around midnight, and from midnight to, like, 6 in the morning, there's, like, sharks with lasers in my head. Just the worst headache ever. And I'll get up and I'll take some uh, ibuprofen, and that'll help for, like, an hour or two. And I'll wake up and just a oh, pounding headache. Then I wake up in the morning, I feel great again. So it must be something to do with breathing while I'm asleep. Oh, check out the tent. So here's a bunch of notes my girlfriend wrote me in here. This is the pollution mask I've been using to sleep. Toilet paper down there, um, snacks, shoes, 8,000 meter boots, keep them in here to get warm. Junk food area, equipment and bags I don't use. There's hats and face masks backpacks and bags over here and then we've got drone and um, this camera bag. Sitting bag, summit suit, <laughs> light puff, heavy puff, uh, gloves we're not using. Oh, up top, summit gloves, socks, dirty socks that are drying out uh, here. Since it's snowing today, we've got the boots, ice axe, crampons, mountain booties, and tripod. It's actually so nice because they said we we're gonna have to share tents up here, which means half of the stuff would be outside right now getting snow on it. But it isn't, and it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, things are good. We do climb to north, top of North Call tomorrow. That'll be a big test. And I put like 80 gigabytes of my old music on uh, my iPhone before I left, and so I'm just jamming out right now. Okay, it's Dave Matthews, totally busted, but it's awesome. Our uh, objective for today is to uh, head up to the North Col, we're going up to the wall and uh, hopefully we're going to get to the top of the North Col uh, at about uh, 7,020 meters. Woo! Got everything? Pant legs? Pant legs? <laughs> got the pant legs? I got the pant legs. Looking at this footage, it's hard to believe how long things take and how big these mountains actually are. Leaving our camp at the bottom of ABC, it took about an hour to reach the top part of ABC, where the Chinese team was camped. From there, it was another hour to Crampon Point. Up to Crampon Point from our camp down at Advanced Base Camp. It took us about, was that, how long was that, about two hours? Yeah. And now we're shooting for the big boy. Here is where you slap on your crampons and take a rest as the real climb begins. From here to the summit, there are additional dangers such as crevasses, overhanging seracs, and increasingly less oxygen. The walk from Crampon Point to the base of the North Call doesn't look far, but it takes another hour before you even clip into the fixed ropes. So this is one of those oven bowl hot days that I haven't actually experienced for about seven years and I think I would prefer one of the super windy cold days because this heat really saps your energy. It is you. so hot. It is so hot and, the, and the, the sun's radiation just bounces off this bowl kind of fries you right in the middle. Patrick and the faster guys on our team, John and Grant, were on the heels of Jongbu. I, on the other hand, was already feeling toasted and ended up at the back of the pack. Just got to the bottom of the wall. It's huge and straight up and it's really hot right now. Roasting. Whew. Huge. The first team on the north side of Everest every year is the Chinese-Tibet Mountaineering Association. 
They choose the route and fix safety ropes to the mountain, allowing climbers to clip in, as David is doing here, with a carabiner and a jumar. Sherpas, with their extensive experience, often skip using the fixed ropes. That's uh, 6,800, uh, maybe a bit more, 6,850, there's probably another 200, uh, 150, 200 to go. Uh, but this is, this is a good place, uh, it's uh, come up a long way, it's been very difficult today, it's been very icy. The next time we come up, <coughs> far more steps would have been cut in the ice, so it'll be a lot easier. Uh, and this is uh, this is a good turnaround place. How are you guys feeling? Good? Paramedic? Yeah, it's good. Oh, bummed didn't make it, but man, that was an ass kicking. We're at like 250 meters from the uh, North Call camp. Couldn't do it. Go down, try another day. <coughs> oh. The slower half of our team, Franz, Dom, Magnus, and I, descended all the way to ABC. It was a gorgeous morning and very quiet at the Summit Climb camp. I hadn't heard from Patrick and wasn't sure if he had stayed up at Camp One or made it back. And just then, he emerged from his tent. It's been a long few days. Yesterday we went up to the North Call and we had a pretty hard push. We got back here and ate and tried to sleep and now we're packing up and heading back down to rest and recover. Heading back down the mountain, the air gets thicker and your head starts clearing. Your aches are still there, but they don't matter. You have made another step towards the objective. Just got back to interim camp, also known as Yak Poop Camp. Mm, yeah, I poop everywhere. There's some, there's some. I think we got about two more hours to go. Whew. Two more hours. Patrick threw in his headphones and blasted down. I stopped often trying to enjoy where I was. Or maybe I was just tired. Yeah. Oh, Chinese base camp. That run out takes so much longer than you think it would. So we left at 10.45 this morning. It's now 5.15. Probably have another 15 minutes or so before I get to camp. Six hours and 45 minutes. So that's ABC to uh, CBC. Now, round one was over. It felt great to be back at base camp. It was comparatively warm, the communal tent was comfy, and the amenities were plentiful. We could catch up on sleep, check the internet, shower. I'll just put some hot water in this bag. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no shower is complete without some yak poop. Shave. Not sure I trust myself at this either. And recover with movie night before going to bed. This is our second full rest day after coming back down from our first rotation and we're gonna take a little walk down to Tent City. An hour later, we arrived. Nothing really going on in Tent City today. I was here 10 years ago and it was hopping. They also had the highest post office in the world. Which I also don't see. Hmm. Good views of Everest though. Martin, what'd you get? Uh, I don't know, I just tons of plastic, let's find out. But the negotiation was not so hard. Upon returning to camp, it was time to nap. The food, which was still very good, was starting to wear on us. We played cards and over-exaggerated everything to keep us occupied. Okay. Oh! Oh, the bomb! Let's go! Sunny and breezy here in uh, beautiful downtown Chinese base camp. And if you look up there, Everest is totally socked in. I think we're in better straits here being in the sun and than we are in, in a uh, blizzard. Blizzard, that looks nasty. It looks terrible. 
So tonight, when I came to bed, I wanted to do some reading. And look what came with my awesome Chinese solar panel. These light bulbs. So now I'm lit up. Got my book. Get my read on. Yeah. Now I'm living. Whew, just waking up. It's kind of a gloomy morning. Cold. Damp. Nothing like the Shackleton Adventure. I just finished that book. It was awesome. Oh man, endurance. If you haven't read it, read it. Another day of BSing and hanging out in the tents came to an end. Tomorrow, we would move up the mountain again. It's about 9 a.m. and today we are hiking up to Intermediate Base Camp. Uh, it's cold, it's snowy. I've got not the best footwear for today. But all my other stuff is up at ABC. So we might hang out and see if the sun burns and the snow off. It's actually not too bad, except the drifts, the snow drifts are pretty deep. Uh, yeah, it's a gorgeous morning though. Nice and cold. Oh yeah. Weather improved dramatically since this morning and we're all headed up to IBC. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we got going, the weather improved. The team had split up. Grant was still packing heavy. Dom, Franz, and Martin were taking it easy. Patrick was rocking out as usual. My feet weren't cold, but they were wet. The yaks continued, bringing up a second round of supplies from those teams. This was our second time on this trail, and we started naming landmarks. Turtle? No, pigeon? <laughs> Angry tortoise. Angry tortoise rock. Yeah. Like it. This part of the trail really feels like you're walking through northern New Mexico in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and just waiting for the cowboys to ambush us or the Native Americans. Yeah, he's kind of an idiot, but an entertaining one. We kept a solid pace. We passed another welcome landmark that indicates the steep climb to the East Rongbuk Glacier is just around the next corner. We even spotted more blue sheep. The yaks were not impressed with the sheep or us arriving at lunchtime corner. Grant a ship captain and avid World Extreme Endurance race athlete had beat us there and was taking a look over the steep drop down to the East Rongbuk Glacier. John, on a mission to tackle the seven summits in a year, was extremely fit. I admired how he had no interest on keeping up with anyone and kept at his own pace. Dom, Franz, and Martin also showed up at lunchtime corner before we departed. Dom is a British entrepreneur. Franz wanted to be the first Paraguayan to ever summit Mount Everest. And Martin, our co-leader, was from Germany and Everest was the last of his seven summits. Everyone on the team stayed within eyesight of each other. So we got the whole team together. Almost up to interim camp. It's not going too bad. There's like a bunch of fast people behind me and slow people in front of me. So I just kind of dropped off, took some shots, and now I'm all by myself, which is nice. I go at my own pace. No pressure to go slow, no pressure to go fast. <sighs> love it, love it, love it. Camp was quiet. Most teams were now staggered in their rotations. With the wet snow making yak poop slushies, we spent most of the time in our tent. Just got out to intermittent base camp. I felt like it was a little harder than the first time. Nah. No? Cheers. How long did it take? Oh, um, 
got here at 4.15 or so. Four and a half hours? Yeah. Not bad. And now we have yak poo tea. Because <laughs> we're in this camp. Yak poo so Patrick and I made the best of our tent time, cracking each other up with stupidity. Pro mountaineering tip. If your feet get wet on the way up, immediately dry your socks. And get your toes warm. <laughs> Thank you, Tashi. Yeah, no Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> What's the soup? The soup looks to be garlic soup. Nice. Yeah. Try and keep them as close to our pee bottles as possible. Uh, yeah. Supper unsweet. We had um, some chicken, some fries of some sort, beans on rice, refried, but um, baked beans on rice, and some pasta. We just realized we've been in bed since four. I like four Kit Kats, <laughs> eating tons of junk food, mm -hmm. listening to podcasts. We only climbed for what four and a half hours today. Yeah. Slept for like eleven hours every night. <laughs> mountaineering is hard work. I mean, it is hard, man. No, oh, I had a, call it grueling. Just had dinner brought to us. Yeah, dinner in bed. Ugh. We don't even get up to pee. <laughs> Another spectacular morning and a long hike ahead. The fresh coat of snow on the majestic mountain kept us going. So after IBC, we went up a or down a really big hill and then up a really big hill. And now we're on this miracle highway moraine. Last time I think it took like five and a half, six hours. So I'm gonna try and take it slow today. Ah, uh, it was right there. It felt like you could reach out and touch it. It was peaceful and meditative. How you doing? Pretty good. Feeling decent. We named the lunch spot between IBC and ABC Martin's Rock, <coughs> as he tried in vain to push that huge boulder off its icy perch. Magnus's cough was concerning. <coughs> it's hard to shun someone from the group as you are all a team. However, when your investments of several years come down to the next three weeks, you try to distance yourself from illness as much as possible. Beautiful. Hard work and traps. Killing. Almost dead though. Almost ABC. ABC's right in front of me. Maybe meters that last hour was a butt kicker whoa yeah the last hour was rough one of the most important things to do when you get to camp is clean your feet and then get them dry just a couple of wipes. Oh, feels so good. And this stuff. I was already tucked in and reading, but decided to do a couple rounds of breathing to increase my SpO2 levels. During this round of breathing, I got my SpO2 from 68 to a high of 91, and my heart rate down from 108 to 57 beats per minute. Good morning. Good morning. 
nice day. Yeah, nice day. Good weather. Today we have our rest day, so we're just doing some gear checks. A lot of BS and hanging out. There's definitely thinner up here. The taste of spring was in that thin air, which also brought its own problems. With the longer and warmer days, our precious spot at ABC was melting into a land of lakes. Patrick found his tent in the middle of one. Tashi had to chop at it with an ice axe to get it out. <laughs> On my own, I took a hike about halfway up to Crampon Point. I wanted to size up the North Call again and mentally focus on my objective for the next day. I could see climbers slowly making their way up and the tents on the ridge. By sizing up the North Call, I knew that tomorrow I would be able to make it to Camp 1. But from Camp 1, there would still be another 1,828 grueling vertical meters to reach the summit. With that in mind, I headed back to ABC. I took a ton of stuff out of my tent. That started snowing, so I had to throw it all back in real quick. And it is a mess in here. Had a pretty good rest day. Went up uh, about a quarter of the way to Crampon Point. And uh, yeah, it's nice. Good lunch. Coca Cola. Tomorrow, North Call. I awoke to a sparkling day. The sun was rising like an ember out of the frozen pinnacles, and the moon was setting into the grasp of Chongxi. The North Coal was bleached white. The birds had been foraging for a while, and the climbers were just starting to rustle. We're about to take off with North Coal. Uh, Sherpas have volunteered to take our sleeping bags because they are amazing. A huge literal weight was off our backs. Now, we just had to relax, take it slow, and put one foot in front of the other. The pace was already agonizingly slow, but with my failure on the last attempt, I wanted to make sure I was conserving energy for when I really needed it. In general though, the majority of the team stuck together. I'll call this section Goldie Rocks. The path up to Crampon Point continues to wind up along the side of Chongxi. The magnitude of this section is misleading. The stretches between a valley, or a rock you may recognize, to another point you remember elongate and take twice as long as you think they should. Come up to Crampon Point. Feel pretty good. Uh, we're going really slow, so should be good. As you near the actual point, there are some small crevasses to cross that are marked with flags. You don't have your crampons on yet, so you take it slow. Crampon Point was much quieter this time around. Everyone was focused on conserving their energy. Until we saw Am Pasan, Magnus's personal Sherpa, who was proving his worth and carrying capacity. It made us all question, why are we climbing this mountain in the first place? Maybe we don't belong here. Oh. This wall is just huge. Feeling pretty good coming up to it, but it's like enormous. It's steep and it's high. There's this last pitch, which is definitely gonna be a hard chore. The day continued to sparkle while the going was tough. The cold breeze helped to cool us off from the blazing sun. We clipped into the fixed ropes and little by little moved up the face. Yeah. How you feeling? Great. Good? Way better than last time. Yeah, me too. You David? I feel <laughs> hot. I I'm feel sweaty. Good. <laughs> and I feel good. The wind's died down, which is good. Yeah. As with the trail up to Crampon Point, the route up the North Call continues to have sections that once you see, you remember. But they just keep coming. The Sherpas had been amazing throughout the trip so far. But from ABC upwards, they are the Yaks. Their ability to carry heavy loads at these altitudes is incredible. After our little rest, I was now higher than I had ever been in my entire life. The challenges continued. Before the final steep section up to Camp 1 on top of the North Call, you must circle way out of your way to go around a sizable crevasse. The last section consists of a vertical ice wall, including an inverted section you have to scramble over. 
Dom and Magnus were going at the normal pace, while Pasang and Jiangbu were hot on their heels. When we arrived, it was our job to find our tents that the Sherpas had put up earlier that day. Now, the Sherpas and David were scrambling as the tents were placed in the windiest of locations. This one here? This one, the next one alone. Welcome, Cliche Louis. Woo! Come on in. Take off your harness, I'll hang it for you. Take off harness? Yeah, take off harness. <laughs> awesome, man. The, How was it? The wall is awesome. It really is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's the scree crap. It sucks. It does. <coughs> Seventy-eight, one seventeen. <clears throat> I don't think I'm gonna do a breath hold now. <clears throat> I know. I'm just gonna keep it high. It felt great to have made it to Camp One. As we did not have a personal Sherpa, we boiled our own water and made our own dinner. Sleeping, however, was not easy. A continuous cycle had developed. Our breath would freeze on the inside of the tent, and then the strong wind would throw the ice crystals off, showering our faces. It was not pleasant. Oof. Had a rough night last night. Headaches, <coughs> snow coming in from everywhere, back is all filled with snow, and then this morning, not good. I'll show you. A rookie mistake, for sure. Too much wind last night. I was glad it had happened on this rotation instead of the next one, as we were heading back down to ABC. The path beyond laid in front of us. The headwaters of the East Rongbuk Glacier, the snow slope up to Camp 2, the traverse to Camp 3, and the summit. It was calling us louder than ever. It felt so close. However, for this rotation, this was the highest we were going. We started to head back down to ABC. Below the North Coal wasn't windy, and it was warm. Beautiful. Our team spread out as we went down and everyone traveled at their own pace. John was taking it easy in the middle of the pack. I was up front with Magnus and the rest of the team was coming down the steep face or rounding the open crevasse. So we just finished our second rotation, which got us up to uh, the North Call, Camp 1. And we are supposed to do a walk up to Camp 2, but it was way too windy. So we came down and had an awesome chill day. It's weird being up on the North Call. Um, supposedly next time we go up, we're gonna be on oxygen, so it should be easier. But, and everything looks so close, but you know it's gonna be, it's gonna be a hard push. That's for sure. Good morning. The winds in the valley are really cool. It's like super calm. And then you can hear it like a train coming down the valley. I tried to record it, but the wind wasn't cooperating. Here, coming out of ABC, headed down to CBC today. Should be about six hours, but we'll see. It felt like a fairy tale walking down. The crisp air, the sunshine, the beautiful pinnacles. The walk was joyful. John was exploring the pinnacles close up. Everything was going perfect. Smooth as can be. Until... The drone screen on my phone went blurry. An emergency crash landing message appeared and the drone started spiraling out of control. I yelled, Martin, eyes on the drone! He yelled back, got it. It smashed up against a pinnacle and landed in a rock. Luckily, it went down not too far from the path, and Martin retrieved it. You sure you can get it? You see it? How's it look? The propellers were broken, but other than that, it was in good shape. It was actually a bit of relief that I wouldn't have to carry it around anymore. I was happy with the footage I got on the North Call. The day was still amazing, and we continued on. 
Oh, that's awesome. Arriving at intermediate camp, we were all excited for the noodles. Doce, a native Tibetan, stays at Yak Poop Camp for two months straight during the season. And without much else to do, he has perfected the noodles. Noodle soup? Yes, please. This is the uh, noodle shack, the yak soba. Yak soba. <laughs> it's pretty good, huh? I've been working on that for the past couple days. Great for halfway down. After the noodles, it was time to get moving again. It wasn't a race, and everybody was walking in their own headspace. Down past the noodle shack in this huge moraine valley. It's gorgeous. The blue and the white of the surrounding mountains. Incredible. Feel great. The yak traffic was extremely light, contrary to their loads. <laughs> Today's been a pretty relaxing walk out. Walked real fast and chatted with John in the first half. The second half, kind of everybody's spread out and everybody's on their own. Some people like going really fast. Other people like taking their time looking at rocks. That's a good one. Oh, so nice stopping. Just kind of taking it all in. No rush. It's amazing being here. So I have one big goal, but it's, it's been a long, long expedition, but it's, it's been pretty amazing. Being here in the tallest part of the Himalayas. The valley run out was more inviting than usual. I was practicing what I preach of really enjoying the present moment. Magnus caught up with me, and I let him cruise by. Just taking it easy. scrambled up to another rock above the trail so I could get a view of base camp from the East Rongbuk Valley. Again, it doesn't look like it should take an hour, but it does. Yay, made it to the ram. Just then, a Tibetan sand grouse joined me. I see angry tortoise rock. Kind of looks like comfortable camel from this side though. Buddy. Talking to rocks now, huh? I keep having to stop and look behind me. It's amazing to be here. Just came around the corner and saw the tents. And even though today it's supposed to be like a, oh man, we gotta do that. Walk back down to Chinese base camp. It's been really awesome, taking it slow. I mean, it's almost, it's hilarious. Like the beginning, setting off, and then playing around with the drone and the drone debacle, and the, pulling out the tripod here and there, going along the ridges and seeing one of the cooking guys, then having these, the noodles, and then looking for rocks again and climbing up things I shouldn't be climbing up with nobody around, taking other pictures. and really really special day it's really nice um, and made me think about all my friends out there around the world who make my life uh, awesome and what it is and you guys know who you are so thank you very much I don't think I have to wait to get to the summit to say that hopefully I'll say it again I've got probably about a week of downtime and then it's go time and uh, cross fingers. Good for hope for good weather. Hope 
hopefully we stay strong. And, uh, So I guess you have to push yourself sometimes to these limits to really appreciate what you have. Eh, I appreciate what I have a lot. Oh, here we go. Yay! <coughs> now, acclimatization round two was over. Patrick is readying the GPS. Everyone's getting ready to roll. It's a gorgeous day. Supposedly they're up there fixing the ropes today. Ah, just perfect. Tiny little bit of wind. Clear skies. And we're about to head out to IBC, the intermediate base camp. And uh, I don't know, four or five hours. Yeah. I'm so psyched to get this going. It was just wearing on me sitting there in Chinese base camp forever. <laughs> we weren't doing anything but eating, drinking, sleeping, reading, and playing cards. It's time to go. We were all eagerly anticipating this final push. Over the last month, we had done two acclimatization rounds, reached 7,020 meters, and we had just spent four days down in Tingri resting up. Now, we pushed off one last time from CBC to get to the top of Everest. Man, that is such a ridiculous view. The sights were still breathtaking. The terrain, familiar. The yak bells, enchanting. We knew the pace we needed to conserve energy, keep our heart rates low, and SpO2 high. So we're just finishing the flat part past Lake District, Speedy Turtle and Ramstein. Now we're headed to uh, turn up hill. This is where you turn and go uphill. Since we had arrived a month earlier, the lakes and rivers were melting, and we heard rock falls more often. Still cruising up the East Rombach Glacier. Patrick put headphones on and just blasted out of here. He's taking a picture and he's gone. Whew. I feel like this like, <coughs> Dry cough right in like top of my lungs. I, think I might have the gumbu cough. Whew. Keep it down. It's just irritation from the cold air and the dust. But it can really affect you up high if you're not careful. Tents ahoy! Up there, interim camp. Feels really good. I feel like I know there's a couple big hills to go, <clears throat> but right now I feel great. Almost like coming downhill. I know, crazy, crazy mountains. Woo, chilly breeze. Just over this ridge, should be IB. Let's see, yak poop camp, yak soba noodle shop. Hey, hey. tea and uh, noodles? Noodle soup. Yeah. The soup here at the Yak Soba Shop, so good. Yeah, it's like a ramen, but then he puts like onions and like green onions and some carrots. It's like magic. Magic soup. How do you say magic soup? Mushutang. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Throughout the afternoon, other members of our team arrived. Before we knew it, it was dinner time. This is our food at Intermediate Camp, and it is Inter awesome. Yeah, it's uh, curry chicken, dal bat with rice, uh, some sort of potato croquettes, mm. and baked beans. It's really nice outside right now, too. Patrick was updating his blog posts with our GPS location using his Garmin inReach. He could also send and receive text messages almost anywhere on the mountain. I did a couple rounds of my Wim Hof breathing before eventually falling asleep. That's an odd angle. <laughs> uh, I had a rough night last night. I was sliding down, tense at an angle. With care, Doce made our morning tea. That got us up and moving. 
Just leaving IBC, up one steep hill. Just catch my breath already. Got some suntan lotion going on. And head to ABC. 600 vertical meters later, we'll be at ABC. And I'm taking a nap. That angle of the tent last night sucked. But look ahead. Now, if you haven't seen in the first or second rotation, coming out of IBC, there's a huge valley. You gotta go down. All the way back up. Good to get the heart going. It wasn't as bright and sunny as it had been our last two times here. But with the pinnacle surrounding us and Everest Summit waiting for us, it started out as an enjoyable hike. Most of the team was in step. We went through our motions. Although it was familiar by now, it is still one of the most incredible places that I have ever been. And I felt very fortunate to be there. After a quick lunch, we made our way through the melting glacier. Grant caught up and Patrick and him sped off. So after the lunch corner and Martin's Rock, you got this huge miracle highway. Oh, just keeps going though. I think it's, oh yeah, it's right around that corner. Nope. You got like two hours, buddy. Get used to walking, get comfy, and do it. I figured I went a little too fast at the beginning. These last hills are killing me. Ugh. Patrick and Grant blasted up ahead. Oh. All right, stay positive. Step by step. Oh. Here we go. Oh man, just rolled into camp. <coughs> <coughs> Those last two hours are so brutal. Mm -hmm. Not fun at all. Oh, and yeah. But it was a good time actually. Um, it's one thirteen. We left at maybe 10? Fucking three hours? It's crazy. Oh, I made it. ABC. Three hours, 15 minutes-ish. Nine kilometers high as well. Now I'm just kind of sorting my stuff. Base camp, my heart rate's probably around 110. So I want to calm it down, so I'm gonna give it around a Wim Hof. Let's see if that breath hold brings it down to where I want it. And also my SPO2 is at like 79. Let's see if I can get that up. By doing the breathing, I was able to increase my SpO2 from 79 to 87 and lower my heart rate from 104 to 65. That's impressive. After my bad sleep last night, I took a little nap and I uh, feel a lot better. Although, I did just run into my tent to grab this camera. I'm quickly out of breath. But, uh, sun's coming out over there. But... Everesto is not. So, supposedly, on the 19th it's going to snow, but we're hoping that it's like most of the time where in the morning it's super sunny and in the afternoon it snows. So that way we can get up there uh, 19th in the morning. We leave 18th at night and uh, do it. Tashi and Nobu were serving dinner. Most dinners were incredibly enjoyable, and you always left the dining tent stuck. Garlic soup and pop it down. When I did, I went to sleep, checking my SPO2. The next morning, I strolled up to the Chinese camp. They showed me through a telescope that several of their climbers were summiting. I ran back and tried to catch them on my camera. Here, there are two Chinese climbers that you can see coming down right from the summit. And then a bit later, you can see three climbers atop the third step. We all gathered in the mess tent for David's oxygen mask lottery. In this lottery, you either get a modern mask or a 1980s used Russian fighter plane mask. Martin pulled a winner. Chef looks small. Looks nice. I pulled the winner. David demonstrates a loser mask. The oxygen is coming through here. Oh. <laughs> oh. Lovely. <laughs> so stuff your face in a vagina if you have one of these, and uh, breathe deeply. <laughs> David gave us a quick overview of the masks, regulators, and oxygen tank system. 
We tested the oxygen. Oh, that four is nice, huh? Yeah. You can really feel it coming through. It was glorious. So tomorrow we make our big move from ABC to Camp One. So just chilling today. Should be good, and then Camp One to Camp Two will be on oxygen. Camp One to Camp Two is gonna be a big day. It's so right like the highest part on Camp Two. Here we go. Next four days. What's the plan today? Plan today, get to the North Call. <coughs> that's it, and that's all. That incident. Plan of attack is uh, nice and slow and easy. It's going to be hot, hot, and even hotter on the slope going up to uh, Camp One. So, going to take it easy, going to take this off, going to look at the enjoyable scenery and possibly the bum of anyone who's in front of me. We said goodbye to the kitchen boys and we were on our way. We are coming up on Metallic Alley, one of my favorite parts of the walk from Advanced Base Camp. How shiny that is. Advanced Base, Advanced, Advanced Base Camp to Crampon Point. With the fresh snow, there was more danger of falling in a crevasse but the big ones were still marked and easy to see. It's kind of nice, there's been some snow over the last couple days. So the final push to Crampon Point is all snow path. And we don't have to worry about tripping over rocks. Can relax, enjoy the view a little bit more. Yeah. Nice walk this morning, Dom. That was beautiful. Yeah. It was nice. Silence, nobody around. Absolutely gorgeous. David, Franz, and Martin were pulling up the back. Martin, a very experienced mountaineer, got his gear on quickly and decided to head up with me. We're coming up to the wall. It's so hot, it feels like you're in a desert. The solar radiation bouncing off the snow. Whew. The North Call, beautiful, steep, dangerous and today, hot. The heat was zapping us, but we had done this before and all knew what it would take. Slow movement, lots of water, and suntan lotion. Yeah, fine, it's only warm. The nice. silence is great. Yeah, making our way up. North call. Move it. Move it, move it, move it. Nice and easy. The fixed lines on Everest are not <laughs> endless. In fact, they're about 50 meters long. At the end of those 50 meters, you must change over to a new rope. It seems like a simple task. You unclip your carabiner from the old rope and clip it to the new rope. Then you unclip your Jumar from the old rope and clip it to the new rope. However, digging your crampons into the snow, positioning your ice ax, bending over, and going through those motions wears on you. What happened to friends? Uh, <coughs> so there's some barrels down at Crampon Points. And it is traditional that people put both their crampons and their harnesses in there so they don't have to carry it up and down from ABC. France left, left both in there and unfortunately someone has stolen his, uh, his harness. I met the leader of the Chinese team and he's uh, very kindly going to donate his harness to France. So <coughs> hopefully we'll see France later on at uh, uh, the North Coal. Nice. We are a little over halfway up the North Col. Way about halfway, aren't we? Oh. Two thirds. Yeah, way over. I'm trying to do it in my head so that I think I have a longer way to go. You guys just blew it for me. Sorry about that. <laughs> <coughs> We're just barely over halfway. Just barely. Started. <laughs> just started the North Col. <coughs> we just left ABC. Feeling pretty good and uh, it was hot this morning which zaps a lot of your energy but uh slowly slowly we'll get going up here <clears throat> and do some deep breathing some Wim Hof as we got going again there was two-way traffic on the safety ropes some descending climbers were too tired to clip in at all 
good. You good? Yeah, good. Summit? No summit. Oh. Oh. My bad. <laughs> My bad. No way. Save your life. You owe me one. Oh. You owe me a beer. I owe you one. Other climbers were delirious. From the combination of lack of oxygen and exhaustion, they were on a short tether to one or two Sherpas. This is called being short roped, as demonstrated by the person in red. Lots of action going on here. People passing, short roping people, summiters coming down, non summiters coming down. Douchebag with the camera just talking over the whole thing. Huge amount of people. Hey, that's They're coming down or going up. Oh, big snow slope there. And we've got this final slope right here for us to get up to camp one. Towards that last steep pitch, you have to be careful not to pull on the rope in a way that will send your teammate flying off. In this situation, if I was to continue, I would be pulling Grant off of the North Call. You hit it. I was finally really enjoying the climb. Being healthy, fit, and full of energy, I was pumped. I could tell Patrick was feeling rough. Yeah, buddy. You got it. <laughs> Again, the loads the Sherpas were hauling were impressive. We were just coming up to Camp 1. Last time our camp was on the far side. Uh, let's see where it is this time. Supposedly they moved it to a better place. Hey, heat. Take it out of you. But again, gorgeous view. <laughs> Crazy day. It's, uh, <coughs> huh? it's a very hot day to come yeah. up to the North Col. Makes it really exhausting. Really, really exhausting. I've never been up in that sort of heat before. Except the first time. <laughs> Except the first time. It's true. <laughs> I looked awesome behind you. It looks crazy. <clears throat> All right. Let's do this. Like a game of 52 card pickup, Sherpas and climbers who had come down from higher were sprawled out all over the camp. I, on the other hand, was annoyingly chipper in both English and Chinese. Shala, you want to shoot Yeah. Oh. We are going to go. Patrick was so beat that he gave himself a timeout. After all those times chasing him up the Rongbuk Valley, straining to keep up with him, doubting my own strength and fortitude, it was welcoming to finally see him show that he was human. Being the good climbing partner, as he had done for me in the past, I made sure I did the majority of the housekeeping. I know how much it helps. Oh. <coughs> you get here, you've got to start boiling water. Uh, both so thirsty and hot. We have no water, so boil time. Oh yeah. Uh. Unlike the last time when our vestibule and our boots were filled with snow, I wanted to make this a solid foyer. I'm gonna go get a tent bag yeah. and fill it with uh, snow. Yeah, like you're set up in the front of the tent. Yeah, we got the vestibule going. We got ours in the middle and it's pretty hot. Good trip today? Yeah, it was good, except that it was so hot. Yeah. But it was okay. Yeah. Hope to stay strong for tomorrow. Lots of people coming down. After summit, well, they look pretty tired. <laughs> wasted days and wasted nights. <laughs> Some dirty dogs. Oof. It's hard. <laughs> Boiling snow when you're tired. Jongbu and several Sherpas had just arrived from setting up Camp 2, and some of them came back from stashing oxygen bottles above Camp 3. We were not that tough. In the dream. <clears throat> Everything's set up. Everything's looking good. Mojalo. And no time to get in the tent. Nice sunburn today. <laughs> Oof. But, oh, yeah, nice. Sh shrimp's doing good. Rampart one, we've got a uh, 1055 on the corner of Elm and 
All right, so to boil snow at Camp One, what we're doing is we've got a big garbage bag, thanks to John. It's ideal to get big chunks like this. And you put that in here, and then it boils. So you do that about a billion times, and you fill up all your water bottles and your soups. And look at this amazing soup I have in here. Oh my goodness. I was able to get my SpO2 up to 75, but my heart rate was still high. Yeah, it's the morning, camp one, and our tent, the inside of it is just covered in frost, which is now dripping. We're trying to get organized for today, but we got this boiling in the middle. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Had a, I, Patrick had a good sleep last night. Yeah. Just getting ready at camp one. Make our way up snow ramp. Up almost to the yellow band today. For the majority of us, this was the first time we were climbing with oxygen. David gave us a reminder of what to do if the exit valves froze, as they often do. Yeah, one hard blow, and it'll generally free up, free up that valve. We decided to make sure everyone was set and their oxygen was flowing before we took off. Looking up at the snow slope and around at your teammates, you can't help but be a bit apprehensive about what lies ahead. One thing was for sure, on Passan, even with that pack on, could run circles around any of us. We started up the snow slope. Dom, in the yellow suit, was in front of me. Little did I know, but the pace that he set and his attitude that day would be helping me just as much as the supplemental oxygen. The snow slope was much steeper, longer, and more exposed than it appeared from Camp One. It seemed as if there was no good place to stop. The steep angle of the snow slope never let up. There was no place to just sit and relax. Here we are. How's it going? Going very well. Chilling out. I finally found a spot that was relatively flat. We decided to take a break. Take a five. Two. Dude, a half a liter feels fine. <coughs> Yeah. Wouldn't mind another half liter. Yeah. <laughs> another half liter would be good, but it's not bad. Our oxygen bottles were set to deliver us a dose of half a liter a minute. We had control of this and were trusted not to run out before we made it to our tents. Ready to the top of the snow field. Woo! Long snow field. There's a long snow field. There you go. It looks a lot shorter from down there. <sighs> I'm glad we only have to do it once. Yeah, right? Come here and touch it with the tips here. Start with us. No snow on these rocks was a telltale sign that this wind was persistent. Dom, in the yellow suit, who had been in front of me all day, continued his outward positive attitude, which at this point was a challenge. We had just got to the beginning of Camp 2, and the rumor was we had another hour or so to go before reaching our tents. <coughs> oh man, <coughs> that was really, really hard. <coughs> uh, our tent is in this crazy position. Golden stock shrimp noodle. And beat at camp too. We caught a sunset over Changsi and Chouyu, the fifth highest mountain in the world. Then we called it a night. Good morning. From camp two. We are way up here. We're down to visit some people. I have to make it back up to my tent, which doesn't look far, and it's not. But there without oxygen 7,700 meters it's not easy see you can see down there holy moly you can camp one I decided to make the early morning rounds and see how everyone was doing how's sleep last night Dom good good moving yesterday 
you in front of me kept me going. Let's do this, man. Yeah, you, you did awesome. Okay. Nice. I slept until like five minutes. Awesome. Beautiful, huh? Look how far down Camp One is. Crazy. No wonder it felt like a long time. That's fucking hard. Shoes on is tough. Camp Two was packing up. David greeted us with his tagline that we had all become very fond of. Good morning, campus. Yesterday, we were down there. All right, we are leaving Camp Two for Camp Three. It's about ten in the morning. Gorgeous day. Unbelievable. How you feeling? Awesome. Can't beat today. Absolutely gorgeous. Straight out of camp two, it was steep. We took it slow as we adjusted our gear and could see the summit just out of reach. I didn't notice at the time, but I caught a couple of climbers coming down from the summit just above the third step. Guys, we're taking a little break here, grouping everybody together. Everybody's feeling good. We've got amazing weather. Taking it nice and slow. Hold on, the leader's gonna talk. This is quite high, and the view is very good. David was right. The views were worth the price of admission already. We could even see all the way to Intermediate Camp and the Pinnacles. Each year, the Chinese Tibetan mountaineering team fixes all the ropes to the mountain. However, they don't take any down. Years of ropes become crumpled heaps. Some have even become single strands that stick like a spider's web to your suit, backpack, and crampons. Other times, you just don't know which rope to choose. Patrick and I were cruising along. We pulled ahead of the group for a bit and then had to stop as Chinese base camp came into view. We could even make out our Thank little you. black Tibetan tea house. We just came around the corner and Everest decided to bring the pain. Look at this slope. The only one on the Lamu, that's 8,000 meters right here. We had officially entered the death zone, the area where humans cannot survive long without oxygen and where most of the deaths on Everest have occurred. Pro tip, when you see the tents, don't think, oh, we're there. It's usually like another hour, and then you get there, and your tent's like 50 times higher than anybody else's. Camp three was coming up over the ridge. Camp one looked as if we tripped, we would land there. And the summit, only a stone's throw away. Because of the supplemental oxygen, my head was as clear as the dark blue skies above me, and I was feeling great. I remember thinking that this was one of the absolute best hiking days I have ever had in my life. And if the summit night is anything like this, it's going to be a blast. We made it to camp three. This place is a mess. Looks like a tornado came through here, which probably happens every night. I mean, stuff's all beat up. We were all scratching our heads. We don't know which tent's ours. None of the tent logos looked like the ones we had been using. We had also beat all the Sherpas here. Not even David knew which tents were ours. All we could do was sit, wait, and take in the views. It was a beautiful day up here, but signs of disaster were all around us. Up until this camp, the mountain had been relatively clean. This was embarrassing and unsettling. The rest of our Sherpas showed up, and they also didn't know where our tents were. Then, Jongbu arrived, and it still wasn't clear where our tents were. Now, it was a bit worrisome.
As it turns out, the Sherpas from different teams make deals with each other for tents at Camp 3. One Sherpa team will leave the tents up there for your team as long as your team carries them down. We then were staying in other people's tents. 3.30 now. So we got this tent that was abandoned. And now we're just gonna relax. David had also found his tent. High above the clouds, at 8,300 meters, Camp 3 is the highest camp in the world. With a slope of about 15 degrees, laying in our borrowed tent felt like we were sitting in recliners. Looking about 74, 105, just got to Camp 3. Not doing any breathing tonight, Wim Hof lies, because we're summiting, <coughs> so I'm just going to keep the oxygen flowing at 2 right now. Um, however, I do think the Wim Hof showers and breathing over the last nine months definitely helped. Um, as far as not getting sick at all, there's a couple times I thought I was going to get sick, I thought I had a cough, I thought I had a cold, but nope. And uh, just the whole breathing mindset actually really helped. So, at Camp 3, both feeling awesome. Headed to the summit tonight. If it's anything like today, we're both stoked. Stoked. And we're trying to figure out how we can drink and be on oxygen at the same time. That was the goal. Drink, rest, relax. You should sleep if you can, but we were both way too excited. We listened to music, enjoyed the views, and ate. Just got some noodle soup. Oh yeah, super thick. I just <laughs> saw Jumbu eating soup out of this. <laughs> David, Jangbu, and all of the other Sherpas were busy boiling water, checking oxygen bottles, and coordinating everyone for the night's climb. Late that afternoon, Patrick and I got news that we would start our summit bid at 11 p.m. We were also informed that according to new Chinese law, we had been assigned a Sherpa so that we wouldn't defect into Nepal. It was Gelje, the first Sherpa I met a month ago. Gelje was strong, focused, and we knew he would set a fast pace. The sun was going down over Chooyu and setting on the summit. Soon it would be dark and our summit night would begin. Figuring out the last minute. Yep. Order of operations here. Goes goggles, headlamp, mask. How you feeling? Feel good. Yeah. Woo! Oh, there we go. What's there? Nervous at all? Huh? Nervous at all? Or excited or what? I totally pumped. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That is why I climb with Patrick the positive attitude. I was nervous, but with that answer, I had to shrug it off and think positive. So we keep track. Brendan looks like this, Patrick looks like that. At 11 p.m. in full summit regalia, we awkwardly clambered out of the tent. The night was still. You, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm almost ready to go. David looks about ready to go. You're about ready to go. Gelje's oxygen was leaking, but once he fixed it, we began the steep ascent for the summit. The exit cracks, as they're called, lead you from Camp 3 through, over, and around cliffs. It was proving more difficult and required more scrambling than I had imagined. Patrick and Gelje were right in front of me the entire time. Gelje was setting a relatively blazing pace. Patrick was right behind him. Once we hit the northeast ridge, the wind picked up and the temperature plummeted. 
Moving your Jumar and safety carabiner from one fixed rope to the next was exhausting. We had been on the move now for about three hours. The cold, wind, and lack of oxygen were taking their toll. Patrick's crampons were kicking out orange sparks as he was failing to gain purchase on the limestone face. Gelje's headlamp further up was my only indication of how steep this cliff actually was. <laughs> this is the beginning of the second step. None of our headlamps revealed what I was hoping to see, the ladders. They are the telltale sign that we had made it to the second step. You've got to be kidding me, I thought. I realized we had only reached the first step. One of a series of three cliffs above 8,500 meters that you must surmount to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Despite my delusion, I managed to follow Gelje and Patrick to the famed second step. I finally saw the ladders and this time knew for certain where we were. At 8,610 meters, the second step is known as the crux of the Northeast Ridge Route. It is a 40 meter cliff on a ledge with a 3,000 vertical meter drop down the east face of Everest. I focused to stay calm as my metal crampons slipped on the aluminum rungs. When I finally crested the third step, I found Patrick and Gelje catching their own breaths. In front of us, the summit pyramid was fading into view. I glanced back over my shoulder to look down the third step. The view was stunning. Below the blackness of space, silhouetting the black fins of nearby peaks, the curve of the earth was outlined by a thin strip of bright orange and yellow light. With the breath of a new day, we headed for the summit. Although every step was a challenge, the rising sun warmed our bodies and spirits. Across the summit pyramid, the path dips below a false summit and exits onto the top of the extremely exposed Kangsheng face, where we could see the shadow of Everest on the earth. The footholds here are barely the width of your boot. This steep rock ramp brought us to another false peak, the summit ridge, and the first view of the prayer flags, indicating the true summit. At approximately 8 a.m., Patrick McKnight, Gelje Sherpa and I summited the highest mountain in the world. Olivia, you and I made it. Yeah. About as large as a kitchen table, we had the summit to ourselves for two minutes before the climbers behind us joined in. Oh yeah. All right. Nothing more to say. Flags out. Patrick's oxygen mask wasn't working too well, and his thinking was a little slow. The wind howled, further chilling the negative 40 degree temperature, and our flags were not cooperating. The world changing speeches we prepared turned into a rushed, jumbled mess as we tried to stay warm. We said what we could. I did manage to get some blurry video of my brothers and my girlfriend on the summit. We took one last minute to enjoy where we were, looking down into Nepal, looking down into Tibet. For a brief moment, our far off vision was realized. But dwelling on our accomplishment was not an option. We needed to start our descent. Well, after two days, we made it back to Advanced Base Camp. It actually took us all of the summit day to get down to Camp 1. 
we wanted to come down to ABC, but we just could not move. Um, then the next day, <coughs> early in the morning, came down the North Call. So then uh, yesterday resting here at ABC. Uh, meanwhile, the other groups got some serious, serious things going on up at uh, above Camp Three and the steps. Um, it got it got really serious for some of them. So we're gonna head down to Chinese Base Camp today and say goodbye. That's a crazy mountain. On Patrick's blog, Climbing on Purpose, he gives a detailed account of the extremely dangerous and preventable summit fiasco that one of our teammates initiated. For mountaineers, especially inexperienced ones, there are some take-home lessons in the blog that could save your life and the lives of others. In brief, out of our team, Heike decided to leave the climb after the first attempt on the North Call. Magnus decided to turn around as he was exhausted after reaching the third step. Dom was having oxygen mass problems and also decided to turn around. These three men made incredibly difficult but correct decisions and are alive today to tell the tales. After Patrick and I summited and were on our way down, Grant, John, Martin, Franz, Jongbu, and David also summited. My last advice. If you undertake an Everest climb, make sure you are in the best shape of your life and believe it. Make sure you are self-reliant and have enough energy to make it down from the summit. As the saying goes, climbing up is optional. Climbing down is mandatory. Finally, enjoy every moment. It is an unparalleled experience that will be with you for the rest of your life. Good morning, campus! Hey. Hey. How are you all?